When you're feeling the need for speed, there's only one thing that'll scratch that itch, and that's going supersonic. But what is that exactly? So let's start the discussion by making sure we're on the same sheet of music with respect to units of measure. Aviators like mariners do not talk about speed in terms of miles per hour. They use knots. One knot, unlike one mile per hour, is equal to one nautical mile, not statute mile, one nautical mile per hour, which equals one minute of latitude. So it fits very nicely into the way that aviators and mariners navigate, which is latitude and longitude. One mile per hour equals 0.87 knots. So keep that in mind as we're talking about knots. I've been asked a number of times, have I ever flown supersonic? And of course, as a Tomcat guy, I've flown supersonic a bunch of times. And then the second question is, well, how fast is that? So first off, let's review the units of measure associated with airspeed. So first you have indicated airspeed. Indicated airspeed, as the name implies, is the number that is indicated on your airspeed gauge in the airplane. And this is what the Tomcat's airspeed gauge looks like. The second unit of measure of airspeed is called true airspeed. And true airspeed is how fast you're actually passing through the air. And then the third measure of speed that aviators deal with beyond indicated and true airspeeds is ground speed. When you're talking about how fast is supersonic, the question is, are you talking about what I'm reading on my gauge or how fast the airplane is actually going through the sky? or how fast I'm actually translating across the ground. Again, indicated airspeed, true airspeed, and ground speed. So here you see the basic formula for Mach number. Mach, named for an Austrian physicist named Ernst Mach. Mach equals true airspeed over the speed of sound. So let's start the discussion by talking about Mach at sea level on what we call a standard day. And a standard day is a dry air day at 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So the speed of sound on a standard day is 667 knots or 768 miles per hour. Now, as you can see on this graph, the speed of sound actually goes down as you get higher. So between sea level and 100,000 feet, for instance, the speed of sound goes down 90 knots. The other question I get is how fast have you gone in the F-14? And as I've mentioned in a number of previous episodes, I was in F-14A squadrons and F-14B squadrons. The engine in the A is the Pratt & Whitney TF-30. The engine in the B is the General Electric F-110. The Pratt & Whitney motor was capable of about 18,000 and change pounds of thrust per engine in full afterburner. And the GE F-110 was capable of about 23,000 pounds of thrust per engine at what we call max afterburner. So let's just talk about speeds that I attained in the B, because that was a faster airplane. At sea level, I've gone upwards of 1.2, 1.3 indicated Mach number. At altitude, which is to say 40,000 to 50,000 feet, I've gone upwards of 1.6 to 1.8 indicated Mach number. And then a natural follow-up question to that is, well, is that the fastest military jet there is? And the answer is no. So let's take a look at a ranking of some of the jets here. Sukhoi 27 is capable of Mach 2.35. Then we have the F-111, which actually has the TF-30 as well, but theirs actually fits in the airplane and was designed for use with the F-111, which is capable of top speed of Mach 2.5. Then we have the Eagle, which is capable of Mach 2.5, so the same speed as the Aardvark. Then we have the MiG-31 Foxhound, which is capable of top speed of Mach 2.83. And finally, the fastest military jet of all, the MiG-25, which is capable of Mach 3.2. So if you say Mach 2.5 or Mach 3.2, what does that mean in terms of knots or miles per hour? So you can see that the calibrated airspeed, which is more or less the indicated airspeed, and the true airspeed are pretty close at sea level. So in this case, Mach 2.5 at sea level is 1,652 knots. What happens to those numbers as we increase altitude? Let's say we climb up to 50,000 feet. You can see our calibrated slash indicated airspeed goes down to 872 knots. Our true airspeed is 1,434 knots. So the difference between indicated and true airspeed is greater the higher your altitude. An F-15 cannot go that fast at sea level. You know, when you see those numbers, you have to ask, what's the altitude that you're talking about? So let's go to the training aids. Let's talk about how we would use supersonic flight in a real intercept slash engagement. So generally during tactical intercepts, we'd be flying around at 
350, 400 knots. So the fuel flow at, at that airspeed at, say, 25,000 feet would be 4,000, 4,500 max pounds per hour. So that's 9,000 pounds per hour in a jet that can hold 16,200 pounds without tanks and 20,000 pounds with tanks. Now, as soon as you go into afterburner, now you're consuming gas at a rate of 4,000 or 5,000 pounds per minute. You will run out of gas fast. You have to be very judicious about your use of afterburner. Also, when you're going supersonic, the airplane does not turn very well. So if you're planning on shooting somebody down in the visual arena, you can't be going supersonic. Now, when the time comes to bug out, now light the burners, unweight to half a G, and head downhill and get going. And by the time we get to 15,000 feet, we're at Mach 1.4. So what does that look like on our conversion table here? So 1.4 indicated Mach number at 15,000 feet. So we're going 751 knots indicated, which is 877 knots true airspeed. So I've done that a bunch, been 1.4 at those medium altitudes. Tomcat is certainly capable of that kind of speed. The other question I get asked is, what does it feel like when you go supersonic? You remember the right stuff where Sam Shepard playing Chuck Yeager sees these colors through his windscreen as he goes supersonic for the first time. I hate to say that's not how it is in real life. At altitude, you can't really tell at all that you've gone supersonic, except by looking at your indicated airspeed that shows that you're above Mach 1. Depending on the atmospheric conditions, sometimes the shock wave would pass over the canopy going aft as you went supersonic, and then as you decelerated, it would come back forward as you were transonic to subsonic. Beyond that, there really were no violent forces acting on the airplane as you went supersonic. But going supersonic at altitude is not a spectator sport. That's where air power demos at the ship come in. So it's illegal to go supersonic over populated areas because you'll break windows and wreak havoc. There are some supersonic operating areas at Fallon and other places, but you got to be up at high altitude, and depending on the atmospherics, that altitude will vary. But when you're on an aircraft carrier at sea and you do what's called an air power demo, you can drop live ordnance, and you can also go supersonic. That's where you can really scratch the itch that comes with the need for speed. So as an airplane goes supersonic, it's pushing air out of the way, creating a shock wave. And that shock wave is what makes the sonic boom. So that noise gets louder or softer based on the size of the airplane. So a Hornet sonic boom is relatively quiet compared to a Tomcat sonic boom. Bigger airplane pushing more air out of the way as it goes supersonic. Because the source is moving faster than the sound waves it creates, it actually leads the advancing wavefront. The sound source will pass by a stationary observer before the observer actually hears the sound it creates. Now, another fun fact is when you pop a balloon, the reason it makes the pop noise is because parts of the balloon's rubber are going supersonic. Also, bullets are going supersonic. So as you listen to the sound of the A-10 firing its gun, the first noise you hear is the bullets going supersonic. The second noise you hear is the sound of that 30 millimeter nose cannon spooling up. The other thing that can confuse people is vaping. Just because an airplane is vaping, meaning creating a condensation cloud, does not mean it's supersonic. So as you see here in this flight demo that was at Naval Air Station Oceana, this airplane is vaping because of the atmospheric conditions. It's pushing air molecules and basically creating a cloud as the airplane pulls G's. But that airplane is not supersonic. Also, you can see in these videos shot from the flight deck, there is a difference between an airplane that is transonic and an airplane that is supersonic. This airplane is transonic. This airplane is supersonic. This airplane is transonic. And this one is supersonic. So for the transonic airplanes, even though they're vaping and there's the noise of the engines, there's no sonic boom. So that's the not too subtle difference between an airplane that's subsonic slash transonic and supersonic. 
So ship flybys are fun to do and also to watch when you're on the flight deck. But in one case, it didn't go so well. This was the 20th of September in 1995 when a Tomcat attached to VF-213 aboard the USS Abraham Lincoln was doing a high-speed pass by the USS John Paul Jones, which is an Arleigh Burke-class destroyer. As they flew by supersonic and pulled into the vertical, their TF-30 came apart. Fortunately, they were able to eject, and they were picked up by the John Paul Jones. So scary stuff, but the guys made it. So the best flyby I ever saw was when I was the air wing operations officer aboard the USS George Washington. So we were operating in the Mediterranean Sea, hosting a Japanese diplomat, and as a function of that, we did an air power demo. So one part of the demo is an F-14 supersonic pass, and the air wing F-14 squadron was VF-102, the Diamondbacks, that flew the F-14B. So my role as the air wing operations officer was to narrate the show up in the tower, talking over the flight deck PA system, known as the 5MC. So we go through all the different parts of the air power demo. It involves all the airplanes in the wing, and we get to the grand finale, which is the F-14 high-speed pass. Now, the pilot for the high-speed pass was a pretty mild-mannered first tour lieutenant, and so before he had manned up, I had sort of gone sidebar with him and said, okay, for this one, we need to raise your game a little bit. So his part of the show started with a call at two miles to make sure he was deconflicted from what had happened right before him. So I hear two miles. Again, I'm up in the tower. I look out across the horizon where I expect to see him, and I don't see him. And then I transition my scan lower, and he is down on the water and he is absolutely hauling ass. Also, he's very close to the ship. So he rages by below flight deck level, very close to the ship, and the boom was super loud. So I look down at the Japanese diplomat, and he gives a fist pump. So the Tomcat disappears past the horizon. The phone up in the tower, which is known as PryFly, starts ringing. It's the ship's engineers. And they're telling the Airbus that the shock wave has damaged some of the ducting below the flight deck. So the next day we have a meeting with the Admiral in Flag Ops. And the captain of the George Washington, who is an F-14 guy, brings his chief engineer. And the chief engineer has a drawing that he made. And on it he shows that as a function of how low the F-14 was, the shock wave bounced off the water and hit the ship from low to high. And that's what damaged the duct. So I was across the table from the captain and I said, I'll tell you what, sir, I hope the Russians don't find out about this. Apparently they could take out the ship without dropping a single bomb. All I have to do is fly by supersonic a few times. And the captain gave me one of those looks that indicated he didn't think that was terribly funny. But in any case, that was the best flyby I ever saw. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. If you're a first time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber. Give me the likes and comment. Check the links below for merch, including Where to Get the Punks Trilogy, my first three novels that were just reissued by the Naval Institute Press. When you check out, use the discount code PUNKYT for 25% off. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the Super Thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wordcarol. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again soon.